Okay. So Parsha starts Vehi Yaakov Beretzi Tsaim Shvasri Shono. Vehi Meshne Shayav Sheva Shani Verboim Shon Mashana. So Yaakov lives in Mitzrayim 17 years. And uh, uh, um, then he lives to 147. Now, uh, it's interesting because how old was Yosef when he left home? 17. And Yaakov lives in Mitzrayim 17 years with Yosef. So that means that Yaakov's real life, Yaakov's real life was the seven, was 34 years that he was with Yosef. That was his, that was the high point of his life. If you look at the first word of the parish of Vayechi, a Vav is six, a Yud is ten, sixteen, a Ches is eight, is twenty-four, and a Yud is th- ten is thirty-four. So Vayechi, what were the, the, the real life of Yaakov Avinu was those thirty-four years, the seventeen that he had with Yosef, and then the seventeen that he has at the end of his life with Yosef. That's what the that's what the Mepharshim say. So then Yosef is uh, Yaakov is getting close to to, to dying. And he calls in Yosef. Vayikra livdoli Yosef. Vayikra vul yimei Yisrael l'amusa. He's getting close to die. Vayikra livdoli Yosef. Vayomer lo imna matzah zichei v'inecha simna yodcha tachet zirichi. He calls Yosef. So the question here is, why does he have to call Yosef? He has to call, he has to summon Yosef. I would, I, would, I, would, I would think that Yosef would be nearby. You know, if he hasn't seen Yosef for all these years, I would assume Yosef is nearby. So believe it or not, there's a medrash that says Yosef, Yaakov is living in Goshen. Goshen is a certain region in Egypt. And Yosef was in the capital in Mitzrayim because he was the, he was, he was the, he, what's that? He's carrying out his duty as a king. Except there are, there, I don't remember if it's a medrash, I think it's a medrash that says that for the 17 years, is, we're not getting Yehuda in there, are we? Yehuda is not getting in there, you know, he has 15 minutes of fame. You know, what do you call the, uh, uh, what do you call it? the? Uh, uh, so the Medrash says that for the 17 years Yaakov was in Mitzrayim, Yosef would never went to see him. He stayed in the capital. He never went to see Yaakov. Did you believe that? After the grand, after that big, the big emotional meeting, and then for 17 years he didn't see him again. Why? Because Yosef was worried that if he goes to Yaakov, Yaakov will at some point they'll be alone, and Yaakov's going to ask him. So what did happen that day when you disappeared? What was the real... And Yosef is then going to have to might speak Lashon Hara about his brothers. So Yosef refused to meet with Yaakov. There's an opinion that for some... Because there's one opinion, that he refused to see Yaakov. He did not see... I mean, he's got a built-in excuse because he's running the country. But he did not see Yaakov for 17 years. That's what the, that's what, that's what the, what the opinions are. If you stop and think about this, is the, the level of the people that we're talking about. That, that, that is the concern because he doesn't want to speak Lashon Hara. So Yosef doesn't see Yaakov for 70 years. That's what it says. That's what it says. Okay? That's one opinion. Now, Yaakov then calls in Yosef and he says, I want you to bury me. Please don't bury me in Egypt. If you take a look, Pasuk Chatzot says, Put your hand under my thigh. Where have we seen this before? Eliezer and Avram. And putting the hand under the thigh represents an oath. Yeah. Now, one of the ideas of putting the hand under the thigh so it says by Eliezer and Yaakov, by Eliezer, by Eliezer and Avram, because the thigh is in the region of the bris milah. Now normally when you, when you make an oath, you take a holy book in your hand, a Bible or a holy book to make the oath to show the solemnity of the occasion that, you're, that you're, you, you mean business. Before they have a Sefer Torah, so the only holy item they have is the bris milah. Now it's obviously not going to take hold of the actual bris milah, but putting the hand under the thigh means it's in the region of the bris milah that you're making the oath. That's one of the ideas. The other idea is that if you put, if you put your hand under somebody's thigh, if, I, if, if, if you put your hand under somebody's thigh, so it's showing that I'm in your hands, that I'm totally dependent on you. So Yosef putting, when you make an oath, especially over here where Yosef is, Yaakov is asking Yosef to make an oath to not bury him in Egypt, to bury him in Israel. When you get buried, there's very little participation of the of the star of the of of the show. The, the 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 deceased does not participate. So Yaakov says, "I put your hand under my thigh symbolically. I'm completely in your hands on this one." The, the, the an oath shows that I'm completely dependent on you. And he says, "Don't bury me in Egypt because Yaakov doesn't want the there should be the uh, according to one opinion there should be the rodents the the the, the what do you call it? not the rodents the uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the the what do you call it the maggots." 
that he has one. The mag now, it says, Rashi says that the maggots will be crawling around under his body. You see, we have a tradition that great tzaddikim do not decompose. They're composers and decomposers, right? They're the guys who, who write the music, they're composers. Right? The guys who don't listen to the music, those are the decomposers. Right? But every, every human being eventually becomes a decomposer. Right? When, when, when they die, person de the body, the body, the body de 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 decomposes, uh, which means it's getting, uh, you know, uh, getting eaten by the maggots and whatever it is that awaits people after they die. Now, we know that they're great tzaddikim that don't, that don't decompose because their body was pure. So the, even the body in this world was so pure that even their physical pursuits were, were all purely the shame shemayim. That means at no point was their physical pursuit, simply physical pursuit, even permissible things. But even our permissible things, a guy eats a, a big salami sandwich, you know, with corn chips and a Pepsi, and I'm doing it all the shame shemayim. You know, crunch, crunch, the shame shemayim. You know, it's it, it, it difficult, you know, can't, uh, it depends what level we're on. It's a, at our level, as long as we're not eating, as long as we're eating kosher food, we're doing well. But there were tzaddikim in the world, somebody like the Vilna Gon, for example, who basically ate bread and water with a very little else, and he even put the bread in his mouth, chewed it as few times as possible in order to get the minimal pleasure from this world, to get the minimal pleasure from this world, and the Vilna Gon died in 1797. Now in 1950, the Russians decided to build a, a, either a gym or a train or something, and it was always happened to be right through a Jewish cemetery. So it happened to be the cemetery where the Vilna Gon was buried. And they had to, they, they were given permission to move his body. So there was a group of 10 people who to, to, to transport, to, to, to move the body of the Vilna Gon through where it was buried in the cemetery in Vilna, and they were given permission. And so a group of 10 men went and they dug up the body and they testified that the body was whole. There was the body, there was no, and that was 150 years later and the body had not decomposed at all. The body of the Vilna Gaon. The, 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 the 10 men who moved his body. It was a very, very heavy decision whether or not to, to do this and they, they moved his body. The Vilna Gaon's body did not decompose at all. So we do have that tradition. So the commentary said, well, Yaakov Avinu, it's unlikely that he would have decomposed anyway. And that's why if you look in Rashi, it says that he didn't want to be buried where there are maggots. That's one opinion. The other opinion is because at the time of Tchia Samesim, the dead are going to arise in Eretz Yisrael. And in order, what, so if the dead are going to arise in Eretz Yisrael, well, what do the people in Chutzlaretz do who are buried in Chutzlaretz? So they're going to have what's called Gilgul Mechilos. They're going to be tunnels under the ground. I hate to use that expression right now. But there will be tunnels under the ground and they're going to roll through the tunnels till Eretz Yisrael. I remember hearing this when I was about six years old, seven years old. I'm just thinking about rolling in the ground. There were, there were tunnels, and then you're going to get up and, and arise the Tchias Amesim, the resurrection of the dead is going to be in Eretz Yisrael. So the Vilna Gaon, uh, the, what do you call Yaakov Avina, did not want to go through that. They didn't want to go through that. Therefore, he tells Yosef, do me a chesed ve'emes. Now, if you pay attention carefully, I'll get you one second, Avi. Fifth line from the top. A kindness and truth. And, uh, a kindness, I understand. You know, when you bury the dead, that's a big kindness. And so you're doing a chesed by burying the dead. Why is it called chesed? What's the emes? What's the truth? Okay, so the truth could be the fulfilling of the oath. But the Gemara says chesed ve emes means the chesed that you do with a deceased, with the deceased, that's called chesed shel emes. Why is it chesed shel emes? because there's no thought of being repaid by the deceased. Every time you do a favor for somebody, especially wealthy people, in the back of your mind, you might have this, uh, like, mm, you know, oh, sure, I'll hold the door open for you. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. So, by the way, there was a story. I, I, I don't, I, I think it's true. I know that it's true that I heard it. There was a guy, a young Avrech, a Kolo guy, and he was driving along, and he saw a limousine off at the side of the road with a flat tire. And he got out of the car, and he, the limousine driver was struggling with the tire. The chauffeur was struggling with the tire, so he got out, and he helped this guy fix the flat tire. The next day, a, what do you call it, a, a truck pulls up in front of this of Rafe's house, and they, uh, it's from a flower shop, and they deliver a big bouquet of roses, a big bouquet of flowers to the house, there's a little envelope attached to it. He picks up the envelope, puts up the envelope. It says, thank you for the help on the highway yesterday. 
I've taken the liberty of paying off your mortgage. Sincerely, Donald Trump. Now, this was a story long before he became president. So I, there's a big, there's a very important lesson, Shia. Yeah, it's an important lesson. If you ever see a limousine off at the side of the road, get involved. Yeah, yeah. If you see, if you see an old Volkswagen, forget about it. You know, just, just kind of go. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. You know, you know, I got a mortgage to worry about. You know, you see a limousine. You know, I go take the chance. Right? That's a, okay. No, but but when there's a when there's a chesed shalemis, chesed shalemis means with the deceased, there's no hope of getting repayment. There's no hope of getting repayment. Although. God repays, but we don't know how God's going to repay. There was a, uh, there was a Jewish guy, a, a principal of a school. So he was driving in upstate New York. He had to go to meet a donor in upstate New York. And there's, as usual, in upstate New York, there was a blizzard, right? Buffalo, New York. You know, in July in Buffalo, there's a blizzard. You know, the rest of the country has sun and blue moon. Buffalo cars are buried under. You ever see that on the news? They have the weather report. You know, Chicago, you know, 55. Florida, 95. California, 75. And in Buffalo, New York, a blizzard. Everybody's buried under snow. So this guy's on his way to upstate New York to meet a donor. He was the principal of a school, I think. He's on his way to meet a donor. And there's a blizzard. He pulls off the side of the road. He needs a place to get. He needs some shelter. So he sees a, a mug and dove it, a star on a door. So he pushes open the door. And just his luck, he's in a funeral parlor, a Jewish funeral. And there's a funeral going on, right? And they're talking about old Sam Goldstein, you know. And there are a handful of people in the funeral parlor, right? And on the way out, you know, he's sitting there like, just my mazel. I can't get to my donor. I'm stuck in a funeral. I can't walk out of the funeral because disrespectful. So he sits there waiting for the funeral then. And on the way out, he sees people, everybody signs the guest book. A few weeks later, he gets a call from a lawyer. He says, Sam Goldstein didn't have any children, and he left in his will that anybody who attended his funeral should be given a certain percentage of his estate he was very, very wealthy, and your percentage comes out to $207,000, you know, $904.91, right? And there you go. So, 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 so you don't know how a coach girl is going to pay you. You know, you did a chesed, and I say, you're there, you did a chesed, Hashem pays you. I don't say it always happens. It hasn't happened to me yet. But it ha it, 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 there are funny things happen in life. Funny things happen. So, so that's why it's called a chesed ve'emes, because when you do chesed with the deceased, so then there's no thought of, of repayment from the, from the deceased. Maybe his heirs will pay back, but not, not from the deceased, okay? By the way, there was a, a, there's a true story. This I know for a fact is true. There was a Froome couple in, in uh, I mentioned this to you guys before, Froome couple in Basel, Switzerland. Froome couple had 13 kids. And one day they get a knock on the door. It's a lawyer. The wealthiest non-Jew in Basel has died. He has no heirs. He's left his estate, in his will, he left his estate to the couple and to the family in Basel that has the most children. This was a from couple with 13 kids. The next biggest couple, the next biggest family is 1.2 kids, a dog, and a bar of Swiss chocolate. You know, and there he is with 13, and overnight becomes a millionaire, multi multi-millionaire. And so, so th this happens. This happens, right? Sometimes in life you see these things happen. We had a guy here who was a student from Orsamach who was living in California, who won the California State Lottery. It was over $5 million. He was so destitute, he had to borrow money for bus fare to get down to the lottery office to pick up his winnings. Yes, I think, you know, you know, things happen. Things happen. I'm still waiting for it to happen, but things happen. Somebody want to lend me some bus fare, maybe there'll be a schooler. You know, if I borrow the bus fare in advance, maybe that'll help me. You know, you never know. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, when you're doing the chesed for the deceased, that's called the chesed al emes. Now, watch this. There's a major life lesson here. So, starting three lines from the bottom, ya Yosef, Yosef uh, swears to Yaakov that he will take his body up to Eretz Israel. And by the way, the commentaries say that Yaakov, what, why did he make him swear? Yaakov didn't trust Yosef? Not only, not only Yosef is trustworthy, Yosef's the king, he can do anything he want. Why does Yaakov make him swear that he's going to do it? Why does Yaakov make him invoke a shvua? Anybody got an idea? So if you remember, when Yosef met Paro the first time, Yaakov anticipated that Paro, when, Yosef, when Yaakov dies, 
And Yosef's going to want to take Yaakov off there. He's going to be away for a while. It's a trip. In those days, it wasn't. You didn't just get on a plane and fly. In, in those days, you know, a few weeks that you're going to be out of the country. Now, this is his finance minister. I don't want this guy out of the country. And Yaakov anticipates that Paro may have some sort of hesitation to let Yosef go. If you remember that when Yosef met Paro the first time, remember I told you there were 70 steps up to the top of the throne and he had to know languages. And Yosef knew 70 languages. And when he got to Paro and Yosef started talking in Lashon HaKodesh, and Paro didn't know. And so that meant that Yosef knows one language more than Paro, which means theoretically he should really be the king now. So Paro made Yosef swear that he won't tell anybody that he doesn't know Lashon HaKodesh. I could just see Yosef getting up to that 70th step. And at every step he's going, now they're looking eye to eye. Paro said, talks him in French, and Yosef answers. Spanish, Yosef answers. Portuguese, he answers. And now he's out of languages. And Yosef just looks him in the eye and goes, Was <laughs> And Paro's like, whoa, 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 what did he say? Right? So Paro makes him swear that he's not going to tell anybody. Now Yosef comes later in this parsha, and he's going to say to Paro, Oh, I got I to gotta, uh, bury my father in Eretz Yisrael. And Paro says, Well, I, I prefer not. And Yosef says, Well, I swore. So Paro says, well, why don't you go and do one of those things where you could revoke the oath? So Yosef says to Paro, if I revoke this oath, I'll revoke the other oath. That nobody knows that, you, that, that, you don't know, that I know a language you don't know. And at that point, Paro says, I think it's a beautiful day for a funeral. Go on up there to Israel, bring me a postcard, one of those ones with Jerusalem, you know, and go ahead, have a good time. Because and that's what Yaakov is anticipating in advance. That's why he makes Yosef swear. Okay, now... But I'm going to give you a life lesson over here. It's not my lesson. It's a lesson, it's a lesson from Rav David Soloveitchik, that's all. Sorry, Rav Soloveitchik. I tell Yosef, ya- Yaakov is sick. Oh, by the way, this is the first person in history who got sick. Yaakov davened that there should be illness in the world because it used to be that people died. How did they die? They sneezed. But there was no snuff in those days, right? No, nobody used snuff. Yeah, I guess snuff makes you sneeze. In those days, you died, you, sne- you sneezed, and you died. That's why we say gesundheit. Gesundheit means you should be healthy. Or you could say l'chaim. Right? You. God bless you. Or l'chaim. That's where, and it, it's interesting, if it's by non-Jews, they do this. There's some sort of tradition. The whole world does this. The whole world, when somebody sneezes, somebody says they say either one or two, they either say bless you or they say cover your, cover your mouth when you sneeze. Right? <laughs> That's a, one of two things. But when, and by the way, this doesn't help. Everybody knows that doesn't help. And people would do the old elbow. When you cough also, <coughs> you cough at the elbow, it doesn't help. I guess it gets out over the elbow. It's just, you know, makes everybody in the room feel good. So, yeah, when, when somebody sneezes, they used to die. He sneezed to death. <laughs> they used to, so, so Yaakov Avinu davened that there should be some illness before death in order that a person could then tell his family, you know, get his affairs straightened out. So when Yosef, the word hine, the commentary is probably the word hine in the Torah is always an expression of surprise. Hine, avicha chola. Surprise, your father is sick. What's the surprise over here? The surprise is because the first person in history ever got sick. The first person ever ever got sick. Usually they just died. I don't know if everybody died of a sneeze, but that's what, that's what it says. So he takes his two sons with him, and he wants them to get a bracha from Yaakov Avinu. Now, Yaakov goes through this whole he goes through a whole uh, discussion here with Yosef, what God said to him, and then take a look at um, Posuk Vav. Sorry, Posuk Zion. Watch this. Seven li- uh, eight lines from the top. Yaakov says to Yosef, Va'ani bevoi mi padan, when I came back from padan, from Lovan's house, mesa alai rochel be'eretz kenan, Rachel died. B'derech ba'od kivras eretz lova Ephrasa. There was a short distance to get to the city of Ephras, the town of Ephras. Va'ekbar Hashem b'derech Ephras he beis lachem, and I buried her there in Ephras by beis lachem. That means Rachel is buried off to the side of the road. Nobody wants to be buried off to the side of the road. Just you know, just bury him anywhere. You take him to a respectable. Place. Take him into the town. Take a look at Rashi. What is, how does this come up over here? Take a look at Rashi. It's the right column of Rashi, five lines from the bottom. If you find it, please show the person next to you. Vani bevoi mi padan. Says Rashi. 
ואף על פי שאני מטריח עליך לא לכן לקבר בארץ כנען, even though I am imposing on you to bury me in the land of כנען, ולא ככה סיסי לימך, I didn't do that to your mother, הרי מסה סמוך לבייס לחם, she died near בייס לחם. Skip down to the bottom line. ואקברה שם, I buried her there, לא הולכתיה אפילו לבייס לחם, להכניס אל הארץ. I didn't even bring her into a populated area. It doesn't mean Eretz Yisrael. I didn't bring her, your mother, I didn't even bring in a short distance. וידעתי שיש בלבך עלי, I know that in your heart you're holding it against me. That's what Yaakov says. אבל דע לך, you should know. שעל פי הדיבור כבר תהיה שם. I didn't do it on my own initiative. I was told by Hashem to bury her over there. I got a prophetic, God said prophetically, bury her here. Why? שתהי לעזרא לבניה, she's going to be a help for her descendants later on in history. כשיגלה עושם נבוזה, אדון ויעוברים שם, during the destruction of the base of Migdash, when the Jews are carried out to exile, they're going to pass by her grave site. יוצאז רוכל על קברו ובוכו ומבקש את סלם רחם. And רוכל is going to come out from her grave, and she's going to cry, and she's going to daven for mercy for those Jews who are going into exile. So Yaakov Avinu says to Yosef, Yaakov Avinu says to Yosef, the reason I did it, and I know that you're upset, and the reason I'm telling you now is because I'm asking you to bury me in Eretz Yisrael, and I know that you're upset about your mother. The reason I did it is because God told me, instructed me. That's why I buried her there, and I didn't even take her into a respectable area. That's what the Torah says. There's a very important lesson here, gentlemen. Very important life lesson. You know what the life lesson is? As parents, did you ever hear your father tell you, did your father ever say to you, when you say to your father, why? And your father says, because I said so. You ever get one of those? Yeah, yeah, most kids have. Those are certain things you learn in father school, right? Uh, one of them is to walk into a house where there are lights on. Does anyone around here turn off lights? Am I the only one who turns off lights? Ever get that? You ever get one of those, right? Okay, there's, there's always that. And then there's the other one, my favorite, which is, oh, you want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. You ever get one of those, Shai? Uh, you want to quetch? I'll give you something to quetch about, right? You want to go, I got nothing to do. Oh, you want me to give you something to do? Yeah, they, uh, that way, all right, okay. There's a, whole, there's a whole list of father expressions, right? So, if a kid says to you, why? You have to explain or you don't have to. There are two schools of thought here, by the way. There are two schools of thought. Uh, there's one school of thought that says, you have to explain everything to the kids. The kid has to know that you're the authority, and you tell the kid to do it. Why? Because I said so. That's good enough for you. There is such an approach, and, I, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with it. There is one approach. I never used that approach. I never said that to my kids. I don't think I ever said that to my kids. If my kids said to you why, I would say, do, just do it. I'll explain to you why. But I just want you to know that it's non-negotiable. I've made a decision already. You want to know why? I'll explain to you why. Maybe perhaps not right now. You know, but I'll explain to you why because I feel that kids are entitled to an explanation. But that's not necessarily the way it has to be. There is, a, there is what to say. There is merit to the idea of, I don't have to explain it. You have to do it because I told you and you're going to have to learn that I'm in charge here. So there are different approaches. My approach was I always felt kids should be explained. Yeah, I have not, it doesn't cost me anything to explain. But I would always emphasize that the fact that I'm explaining doesn't mean that, there's, that the decision is up, the decision was made, because I make the decisions. That you do have to accept, that I make the decisions over here. Sometimes I leave the decision to the kids. But if a kid said to me, you know, a kid comes to me, you know, your 15-year-old says, Dad, could we go, could I go up with my friends? We want to go up to the northern border uh, for vacation. We want to go up to the Syrian border and do some uh, bungee jumping and alligator wrestling. Can I go? And the answer is no. Why? I'll explain to you why. I just realized I made a decision. Because the Syrian border is a dangerous area, bungee jumping is dangerous, alligator wrestling is dangerous, and that group of friends of yours are the most dangerous of all. Therefore, no, you cannot go with your friends on a road trip or bungee jumping or scuba diving off the coast of Nova Scotia or whatever it is that you want to do. No, the answer is no. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Now, there are two schools of thought. There's one time where you must explain to your kids. There's one time where you absolutely have to explain to you. You know where that is? Where what you're telling them contradicts your own behavior. Then you have to explain it to your kids. That's what we learned from Yaakov. Why does he explain this to Yosef now? Why does he also bring up Rachel? What's, what's, what's this got to do with anything? 
He's coming in, he's about to die, and Yosef wants a bracha. What are you talking about Rachel and bearing Rachel for? What are you going through a history over here? The answer is Yaakov has just asked Yosef, at least in proximity of the Chumash, he's just asked Yosef to bury him in Eretz Yisrael. Like, whoa! What's up with that, as you people say? What's up with that? Yeah, yeah, oh, in my own mother, you couldn't take her 2,000, you couldn't take her about a half a mile into the, into the, oh, now I have to explain. When does this come up? Imagine a kid comes home from school. Yeah, you're a, you're a good, you're a good from family, and you lose, you learn your two halachas a day of lush and hara, right? And we don't talk lush and hara in the house, we don't talk about people in the house, we don't, then your, your nine-year-old comes home from school one day, and he smells mysteriously like a cigarette, you know, Zalmi, were you smoking? Yeah. Where'd you get the cigarettes from? Someone in school. Who was it? I'm not allowed to tell you it's Lush and Hara. This you have to tell me. But Daddy, you always tell us not to speak Lush and Hara. There you have to explain why. Because the kid has to he doesn't understand the contradiction over here. He just, he doesn't, you're always telling me not to talk about why is this okay? The kid's confused. At this point, you have to explain to him because... Cigarette smoking is not okay, and he's a danger to the cheder, and I want to know where I could get cigarettes cheap. You know, whatever it is, whatever it is that there, whatever it is you want to know who this, who this peddler is, that's where, that, that, that. Yeah, the same thing apart, you know, you know, if you don't want your kids to smoke, and a father smokes, and you don't want your kids to smoke, forget about it, you haven't got a chance. Your only chance is the kid is smart enough himself not to start smoking, but if he sees you smoking, and you try to tell him, don't smoke, it's not good for you, <coughs> right, that's not going to work. And I think it's just not going to work. If father, father's an alcoholic, and he's telling the kid, put down, put down the booze, right? Yeah, I am going to put it down. I'm going to put it down my throat just like you do. <laughs> right? That's not going to work. That's not going to work. You're, you, can't, you can't live a contradiction. But when you have, let's say for the father, for example, he has to answer his phone on Shabbat because he's with Hatzalah. Daddy, why are you answering the phone? There you have to explain it to the kid because you always tell the kid, we can't answer the phone on Shabbat. So you have to explain it to the kid, otherwise the kid doesn't, the kid doesn't understand. So when you're, when you're living a contradiction, then you have no option, then you have no choice. When, you have a, when you're contradicting yourself, that's when you have to do it. For one of the issues in the firm world, by the way, is smartphones. iPhones, smartphones, I don't know, what's the difference between an iPhone and a smartphone, by the way? Smartphone refers to Android, and iPhones, iPhones is just iPhones. Or smartphones could just be any technologically modern phone. Uh-huh. What's an Android? <laughs> it's any phone that isn't an iPhone. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, okay. So now, uh huh. It's a type of smartphone. iPhone is a type of smartphone. Oh, iPhone is a type. Oh, iPhone's a company. Oh, I thought it was a type of. Okay. Okay. That's that is iPhone is the name. Of, it's like it's a like certain, but the, the, the generic the generic term is smartphone. Okay, smartphones. Now they have smartphones are, the, are a big issue in the firm world. Men. Fathers are allowed to have a smartphone if they have it for work-related. That is the psak from the gedolim. If you need it for work-related uh, stuff, it's got to be filtered. It's got to be filtered properly, and so on and so forth. Children, kids, in the firm world, no smartphones. No smartphones. The yeshivas don't let smartphones. I'm not talking about our samach, but with the mainstream yeshivas, no smartphones. Nobody called. What happens if a father has a smartphone? And the kid doesn't understand. So the answer is because I need it for work-related stuff. But it better be for work-related. If the kid sees you in the back room kitzeling around at home, watching something, you're playing around and doing something sophisticated on your phone, which is not work-related, then you got a problem. But as long as you're not kind of, as long as you're using it properly, at that point you do have to understand, explain that to a kid. That you do have to explain. That's the, that's the, 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 what do you call it? When you're doing something, that's the first lesson the Torah is teaching over here. Then, Vayar Yisrael es b'nei Yosef, Vayomer mi Eile. Yaakov sees Yosef's sons, he says, who are these? Vayomer Yosef el aviv b'nai heim asher nasan li elokim b'zeh, Vayomer kachem na elai v'avarachim. He says, take them to me, and I will bless them. Now, if you understand the expression, Yaakov says, take kach, kach, kach means to take, right? What should it say? Bring them to me, and I'll bless them. Why does it say, take them to me, and I will bless them? Here's a blatant question. In Hebrew, you say, you should have said, tovi osam, have osam. Why does it say, kachem na elai? Take them to me, and I will bless them. What's that? That's what? 
Yeah, but the word kachem doesn't really literally kachem means take them to me. It's like it's like it's, it's like you know when you, my my grandparents came from Europe, you know, oh take me a take me an orange, you know, take me an apple, you know. You know then, then what do you call it? But but that's not the correct pronunciation. Why is it the word kachem literally means take them to me? So unfortunately, say who's taking, who's on the receiving end over here? Yosef is really the one on the receiving end. He's taking. Take them to me means you're going to take something by bringing your kids to me. What is he taking? There's no bigger bracha to a father than that he has children that he could bring to a grandfather to give them a bracha. So you're getting something out of this also, Yosef. You, having your children, that's the biggest, the biggest bracha for parents is that their children should get a bracha from a tzaddik. So you're, by taking, by bringing them to me, you're actually taking because you're going to be receiving. You're on the receiving end. You're on the biggest gift a father could possibly want. Could possibly want. It says, Kochem na'elai vavorechem. Ve'ene Yisrael kavdu b'zoken. Now watch this. Ve'ene Yisrael kavdu b'zoken. Yaakov's eyes were heavy from old age. Lo yuchal liros. He couldn't see. Ve'yagesh osam elav. Yosef draw, brings them near. Ve'yishak lahem ve'yichavikam. He kisses them and he hugs them. So I heard an unbelievable explanation here. You've ever heard of it? When I was growing up, the expression was a generation gap. Did you ever hear that expression? Generation gap. That means, generation gap means, you know, my kids listen, for example, my kids listen to what they call music. You know, what they call music, I call, in the best scenario, noise. Uh, uh, they got all sorts of shagindalach and shtick and all sorts of stuff that they're into. Uh, and I say, I was walking upstairs, I see three guys on a couch. They're all like this, like three blind mice. The three guys are sitting on the couch upstairs, each one of them with a with what is a phone, a smartphone, an iPhone, a something or other. Uh, uh, and they're all like this. In my generation, people talk to each other. And you look at the next generation. I don't know your shtick. I don't know what you're up to. Your music. You're what I, I. There's always that gap. My parents made fun of my music. You know, my parents said some our shtick. We were also a bunch of Michigan. To the every generation looks at the other generation. And the ones who are really detached are grandparents. Your grandparents have any idea what you're up to? They have any idea what's going on in your world at all compared to the world they were in? There's always that, that you know. So Torah is teaching over here. Sometimes you get this gap. And sometimes you're not really happy with what your kids are doing. And your kids are experimenting with drugs. That's what they used to call it, experimenting with drugs. Uh, that's some experiment. <laughs> that's some experiment. Will I survive this or not? <laughs> Let's have the experiment. They're exper that was the fancy way of saying well, he's exper You mean he's using drugs? That's what you mean. He's using. He's experimenting with drugs. He's he's what he called. They, they, can, can you imagine? Yeah, I had a friend. I'll tell you. I'll tell you where where it is. It's got, I had a friend who worked for he worked for McDonnell Douglas. He was designing planes. He was designing uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, F-16s. He was working at one point for Israel Aircraft. So this guy himself flew in an F-15. He was always, even as a kid, he was always shooting off rockets, rocketry, that sort of thing. His father was a Holocaust survivor. So this guy once parachuted out of a plane, and he ended up breaking his knee when he, when he, when he landed. Apparently, when you, when you parachute, that last, when you land, the impact of the landing is like dropping, jumping from about six feet up. It's not, it's not, like, a, it's not like a feather hitting a pillow. You know, it's, 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 it's a nice little, nice little pop. So he broke, he wrenched his knee. He broke his knee, he had to have surgery. So he called his father up. He was out, he was out of Chicago at the time. He was by his, in his, by his sister and living out of state. So after the surgery, he calls his parents up. He talks to his father. He says, well, Baruch Hashem, I, I had the surgery. I broke my knee and I had surgery. Everything's okay. So his father says, how did you break your knee? He says, I jumped out of a plane. So his father says, to, was the plane on fire? So he goes, <laughs> so he goes no, no, I, I parachuted. He goes, what was wrong with the plane? He goes, nothing, I were, you know, parachuting for sport. But the plane wasn't okay. The father could not get past the point, past the fact that somebody would willingly jump out of a perfectly good plane. Frankly, neither can I. But the father couldn't, he just couldn't get, that's the gap. That's the gap I'm talking about. You got, what, what, what are you, Miss Sugarner? So nowadays you get people who go traveling all over the world. Yeah, you know, young people, they go, to, they, they go traveling all over. I never traveled all over. If I, was, I traveled if I was lucky to be traveled around the block. 
Uh, that was, for me, a trip was crossing the main street, and that was when I was 22. You know, nowadays, uh, hey, people go to Tibet, in India, in Africa, all They're all over the place. They're all, oh, who's interested? Your parents are, your parents are busy trying to earn money and make a, make a living because uh, i got to go travel the world. That's the gap. You don't understand your kids? I don't even see Yaakov, he's blind, meaning I can't see your world. I don't know what you're all about. There's only one thing you do. You kiss them and you hug them. Keep them near. Show them love. That's what works. You kiss, I don't know what you're into. I don't know what your are into. Your values have changed. And by the way, this is advisable for Bali Chuva parents as well. Parents who have kids who are Balchuvas also don't understand your world. Who understands the world of a Balchuva? Parents are looking at your world. What's going on? What are you out of your mind? What was wrong with the way we raised you? What's wrong with our values? And it's a gap over there. The parents who have succeeded in bridging that gap are the parents who they didn't stand on, you know, parents are upset. And I understand that parents are upset. You're rejecting everything we gave you. You're, you're embracing this. as ridiculous. On your end, you guys have your own reason. We have our responsibility. You have your responsibility to maintain peace with the parents. But the parents who have made it through with their kids, suffering through the terrible calamity of their kids becoming Bali Chuva, are the parents who have embraced their kids in spite of not understanding it. We don't, we, I, I don't understand that I got, you know what, but I still you embrace your kids. And parents often, I'm not necessarily happy with every choice my own kids have made. Many parents aren't necessarily happy. That doesn't, you're my kids, you hug them and you kiss them. That's what the Torah says. I can't see you, I don't understand you, I don't know why you would be doing this, but that does not compromise the relationship at all. And that's how you keep the kids near. That's how you keep them in the fold. And this is one of the issues in the Torah world today where kids are what they call OTD, right? OTD, they're, they're off the derech, right? The kid goes off, they go, he's off the derech or the kid's at risk. We had a guy here once on a program, uh, an older guy came to, to Rosh Hashiva and he said, heck, kids at risk. Heck, we're adults at risk. A from guy, and it's true. Adults are all, no, only kids are at risk. Adults just got it all worked out, you know. Only kids are at risk, right? So one of, one, of the things you have to, one of the things you have to do, your kid is a your struggling kid struggling with Yiddish guide. It happens from family, and the kids are struggling. I, okay, listen, I'm not happy about it. You, hug, you kiss them and you hug them. That's, the, that's what the Torah is teaching you. Okay. So now watch this. I never entertained the thought that I'd see your face. And I want to show you something fundamental, gentlemen. The word pilalti, how does, I, how does the art school translate it? I dared not accept the thought that I would accept that I would see your face. Yaakov could imagine that he would ever see Yosef. Now I want to ask you something. When you entertain a thought, what does that mean? Listen carefully. This is so fundamental. When you entertain a thought, that means that the thought comes into your mind, right? The thought entered, it never, it never even popped into my head. We even use the expression, like, it never popped into my mind. Never, I never entertained the thought. The word pilalti, the root of the word is pilel, which is also the word tefillah. Now, there is a very, very cynical approach that many people outside the, many people over say, people will say, I don't need to daven. I don't need to pray. God knows what I need. What do I got to tell God what I need for? Number one. And number two, what kind of ego does God have that I got to keep saying how great he is? And that's the cynical excuse people use to not daven. And the cynical excuse of this whole approach is because of a complete misunderstanding of what davening is. When we're praising God, God doesn't need our praise. God doesn't have an ego. When we're saying ata gibor, ata kadosh, why are we saying it? To penetrate ourselves with that thought. When we ask God, God, please, I could use another bottle of Blue Label, <laughs> right? Because the one from yesterday is gone already. <laughs> Not really, right? But I wish. But you know, I could use a Mercedes. I could use a better partner. I could use better health. I could use better this, better that. Why are we telling God? God knows what I need. But what it does is it penetrates us with the idea that God is the one who gives it to us. And when we thank God for what we have, we say, Modi we thank you, Rebbe Shalom. 
that creates an awareness in ourselves. Tefillah is not from in out, it's from outwards in. It's a fundamental mistake people make. So people say, oh, what do I got to dive in for? God knows my needs. I know that God knows your needs. I also know your needs. Brains is one of them, right? That everybody knows you need. We know that. Please, Hashem. Please, Hashem, you give man wisdom. Oh, my neighbor needs some wisdom. Right? We know that. But why am I saying it? I'm saying it because it creates that I understand it. I know what God, I know what I need. God knows what I need. But I got to appreciate the fact that there's a God who's giving it to me. How do I appreciate the fact that it's God giving it to me and not my, my great wonderful talents that have done nothing for me but get me in trouble? How do I understand that if I ever succeed at anything that it has nothing to do with me and it's all because of God? By constantly making that connection. By penetrating myself with those thoughts. And if the, the more you think, and the, that's why if we request things from God, we're requesting it. What do you think? God doesn't know what I want. God doesn't know what I need. The more I ask for it, the more passionately I ask for it, the more I internalize the fact that, that, that the only way I can get it is if God decides to give it to me. And if I want Parnas, it has nothing to do with my effort. Because my effort is meaningless. My effort can't, I can't do anything my effort. My effort doesn't help. I have to make an effort because God said make the effort. But at, ultimately, I have to know that my effort doesn't help me. Where does it, it's coming. So the word pilalti, Yaakov says, I never entertained, it never entered my head that I would see you. And now what have I got? I even see your offspring. I even see your offspring. That's something that, 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 that what do you call it? Now, watch this. Take a look all the way at the end of the Parsha. show you something amazing. We'll just end with this. Look at the end of the Parsha, where Rashi says, um, The Torah says, um, oh, no, 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 wrong one, wrong one, wrong one. Oh, sorry, 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 wrong one, wrong one, wrong one. I got on the next one. Sorry. Okay. Vayotze, go, go to page 272. Sorry, sorry, premature. So, Vayotze Yosef Osami in Birkov. Yosef pulls the kids back and he bows down. And then he's going to bring them now to Yaakov for the brachas. All right, this will have to leave for next time because it's good. this is going to get involved now with, with, the, with Yaakov crossing his hands. Okay. Um,